the scripture, and we'll we'll do it in in two parts. So Sarah will bring the the first eighteen verses, and I will bring the next eighteen. Listen to the word of the Lord. So I'm going to read John twenty one to eighteen. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter, and reached the tomb first. And stooping in to look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Women, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Like Roger said, can you imagine? (laughs) Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. I'll continue with. Puts my memory of being on a ship at sea and can't think. So just just to come up for a breath. It's early in the morning, and John, his focus is is on the lady that had demons in her. And she gets up early in the morning and encounters Christ. But there's another thing that happens at the end of the day. And so I read now 19 following. Now, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were together due to fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. Just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, 
one of the 12 who was called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be to you. And then he said to Thomas, Place your finger here. See my hands and take your hand and put it into my side and do not continue in disbelief, but be a believer. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you now believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. So then many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now just close your eyes for a moment. Heavenly Father, we commemorate the death and resurrection of Jesus, though remembering this every time we assemble. We thank you for the cleansing of our hearts, the renewing of our spirits. We thank you for power to work the works of righteousness. We thank you for the spirit of the Lord in us. We thank you for the scriptures of God that give us counsel and cannot be refuted. We ask you to open our hearts that we may believe further and follow you more firmly. We ask you to do more above, beyond what we're imagining. Oh God, break through the husk of our hearts and circumcise us yet even more that we might be sensitive, pliable, flexible, merciful, humble, soft, and yet crushing the feet of Satan under our feet. We love you forever in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. So I am, um, we're coming out of 40 days that we marked on our particular Summon Harvest calendar to challenge to challenge us on um, Romans 6 truths, which in a sense, Paul the Apostle through the Spirit is saying, put down your sin. Put it down. Put it down. And to that end, as, as much as you could, I've, I've asked you to do three things in 40 days. To think about yourself. Not in a selfish way, not in a narcissistic way, not in a self-aggrandizing way, but to, to ask the questions, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I the way I am? How is it that I'm like this when I believe that? And to have those kinds of thoughts through 40 days, and then to take your prayers and to be praying in the car, on the way, at the sink, picking up the kids, asking God to break through to my life. And then to accentuate those prayers by a period of fasting. So I've asked, I've asked you to do that. I think you probably have. And, but I'm under no delusion that you've got, aha, I'm better now. Um, I'm just hoping that there was something in the order of enough wind in your sails to think, I probably ought to do this more. I probably ought to do this more frequently, more routinely in my life. And so I'm urging us to think about the past 40 days and go, is it not right that I should be thinking about my soul? Praying more as the men have talked about prayer. Now for like months, we get together, we just talk about prayer. It's amazing. 
And then to, I don't know, I, I would be very interested, very interested for you to talk to me and to each other about what insights or what did you learn, what did you perceive when you were fasting? What, what ha happened? Because there's so little talk in our church culture about fasting. And I think, I think I asked us to all just take little tiny baby steps, but I think baby steps ought to turn into something a little more substantive. And I'm curious, what did you learn in the baby steps? What did you feel in the baby steps? And so I'm encouraging us to uh, move forward. Now, I would be remiss on this day if I, I didn't rehearse basic Christianity 101. I, ho I hope you're not bored, but I, I, fear, I fear this every time I, I stand up in front of people that I, what I would say would have no substantive feel in your heart and, and um, I'm required by Christ to tell you what you already know. And so I'm, I'm thinking about on, on this day when Jesus had died and he rose out of the grave, and then he will, not net on this day, 40 days hence, will be ascend to heaven, which the scripture says, and he, he was exalted by God because of the resurrection, and then the exaltation was shown the way he was lifted up to heaven and came, came to his father. I, I'm rehearsing now what is true because of that, and you know the truths but I just feel bound to have to at least list some. And so here, here are basic Christianity 101 truths about what happens because Jesus died, rose, and ascended to heaven. What is true because you believed on him? And so the number one thing, and you, you got this, the number one thing is you are, you are, watch me, you are forgiven of your sins. You are forgiven of all your sins. Sometimes I'm, I'm, my brain has been stuck with, I'm, I'm sure that Jesus forgave me up to the point that I believed in him and all those sins up until that point he forgave. But after that, I'm kind of on my own and have to, have to constantly confess, confess my sins in order to get the forgiveness. That, that's not exactly right. He has forgiven you of all your sins. In fact, all my sins were all future sins when Jesus died. And so the sins that I'll commit in the future, I don't know. But Jesus has them. Because everything in my life was future when he died. Everything in your lives was future. When Paul and Barnabas, um, at the point that we ended in the, our study in the book of Acts, left Antioch as the new apostolic first team, missionary team. And they left Antioch in that northeast corner of the uh, Mediterranean world. And, they, and there's this sea, the Mediterranean Sea, that's just right there on the coast. And there's this island out there. That's where they first went. They went to the island, Cyprus. And we'll learn in the book of Acts that Mark must have had, it's an inference, must have had some bad experiences there. Actually, Mark's family, John Mark's family, and Barnabas' family was from Cyprus. So it's about proclaiming the gospel and seeing the power of God in, and while his family's watching. And it, it spooks John Mark enough that when they leave the island and they head straight north to what is Turkey, that John Mark abandons the team. And now it's just Paul and Barnabas. So they're in Asia Minor for the first time. They just got off the island. They went north in, the, in modern Turkey. And they head into a synagogue and they preach. This is, this is what Paul says, just in, in short. Acts 13.30 says, But God raised him from the dead. He whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. <laughs> so the Gentiles are getting this now for the first time. Where does he go? First thing, you are forgiven of all your sins. The Apostle John will write, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. 
Paul will write in Colossians, Jesus delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, comma, the forgiveness of your sins. I was thinking of this passage when Mark Snyder came up for communion meditation last week and he was telling us about the, the power of the forgiveness of God and, and I remembered this verse, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, Jesus made you alive together with him and having forgiven us all our transgressions, that word all is in there in Colossians, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was very hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross. So what Paul is doing is he's saying, he's not just saying, you have forgiveness of your sins, like God's saying, okay, it's, it's okay now. He, he's, he's pressing it further. He's saying, you're forgiven of all your transgressions. You're canceled out. The certificate of debt is canceled out. He has taken it out of the way. And he's nailed it to the cross. So he's using pictures to tell you it's not just, I forgive you, it's okay. It's saying, and he used the word up here. He said there was this like, and he used the word remittance. Like I'm expunging this from your life. And he's taking it out out of the way. Have you been forgiven of your sins? And if you believed on Christ, the answer is yes, yes. I knew when I came to Christ, I would, did not come to Christ aware of my sinfulness in my life. I came to Christ for the sin that I had just committed. I, the first time in my life, I cursed. Can you believe that? At 18, hadn't cursed till then. And then in one moment of fed upness, I just blasphemed God with every word I'd heard in the military <laughs> environment. And I, I, then I was sorry. And I made a deal with God, and I said, if you show me the way of peace, I swear to you, I swear to God, I'll follow you with everything I got. But you won't, because you don't care. I've said this before to you. And I was forgiven of my sins when I wasn't thinking about my sins except one sin. But I knew I was forgiven of all my sins because I had this strong sense of acceptance God came to me. God's treating me like a friend. That's what happens when you're forgiven of your sins. It's like this weight comes off you and you're like, I'm I'm different. And that's just the sense of being forgiven of your sins. That's not describing anything else. But when Jesus came and rose from the grave, you're forgiven of your sins. That's number one. Number two is your status, meanwhile, changes. John writes this epistle saying that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't know if you've thought about this, but your status changes and he calls you a Son of God. What? Not in the same sense as Jesus, but he uses the same term. Like you and Jesus are brothers. Your your status is a child of God. Literally, sons of God. That's like, wow. That ought to hit you, but you've heard it so often, it doesn't doesn't hit you anymore. I'm not sure how to press this point, because I'm... I'm probably about to say something off. Sometimes I think that there may be a difference between being regenerated in your heart or born again and being an authentic son of God. I have to think about this because my brain says I think they're not quite the same. Here's what the scripture says. So first of all, you know this verse. Behold what manner of love the Father has given 
unto us that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, says John. The, the apostle says that in his epistle, in his gospel, he says, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. I just watch those words and I go, well, what am I now? And so that word power is in the ESV um, and the New American as he gave the right to become children of God. That word can mean authority to become, privilege to become, charge to become, domain to become, dominion to become. He gave you, he gave you the oomph to become a children of God. And then Paul writes, for all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. I go, in one sense, in one sense, the Spirit is leading all his people. So we're children of God. In another sense, I recognize that many times I don't follow the leading of the Spirit. And so I have to think about all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. And I'm just dropping that in your lap, that um, Jesus changed your status, calls you a son of God, and sometimes it seems like it's conditional. Surely he has changed your status, but are you being led by the Spirit as a believer? And thirdly, that this is the other thing provided by the, the death of Christ and the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Because Jesus has taught the, the disciples, when I go away, when, when you're not, I'm not here anymore, I will send you another helper. And he's talking in John 14 and 15 and 16 of the Holy Spirit who will come. And so we spent a whole year in the book of Acts uh, underscoring the fact that Christ provides you the availability of the Spirit of God who, who regenerates your heart, helps you understand the gospel that's written in the book by the Spirit. And he gives you the Spirit to help you against your sin. We, we, but we need to ask ourselves, the self-same Spirit that we have, am, am I a person who is being authentically led by the Holy Spirit, I think every Christian on the planet should ask that question. Because I don't know about you, but I can have a doctrine about the Spirit and believe the doctrine that I believe. But in actuality, I can be not following the Spirit of God that I believe that I should be following. Are you tracking me? And, and, and I just think we really need to contemplate about ourselves. What's going on with me? Am I following the Spirit of God? Am I doing the works that un as unto Jesus that he did? Those three things, forgiveness and status change in the Spirit of God, seem to me to be not hold up to a hamstring to where the apostles really point their emphasis on because these things happen to Jesus, this is what's available to you. And where they really spill over the top is not in this life. So you have forgiveness in this life, you have status, son of God, in this life, and you have the spirit of God in this life. But when they say, when you die, that's where it really shines. And so I'm just gonna read to you one passage. 1 Corinthians 15, three verses, four verses. Behold, I'm telling you a mystery. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm unfolding for you what you didn't know before. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. This is basic Christianity. It doesn't end here. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable must 
put on the imperishable. How does that happen? It's like putting on a robe. And this mortal will have put on immortality and then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And John adds, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold, we are sons of God and it does not appear yet what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him just as he is. That, that, that blows my mind. Some theologians have called this the glorification of the believer. That you will be made like Jesus. I was like, wow. And I know we don't go around in our daily Monday through Sunday life thinking about that so that is like a wow that's awaiting you so now I will just touch the reading that we had I gave you the fundamentals here's what all just I want to think about I'm not going to expound 31 verses I'm just going to give you the two pictures so that when Jesus rose from the dead I can't help but think the Garden of Eden, honestly, because there's a man, there's a woman. Later on, there's a man. And so we have the case of a woman, Mary Magdalene, and the case of the man, Thomas. John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, focuses on this. And so, so think about this, that Ma Mary says the scripture, says Mark and Luke, that she was there at the cross watching Jesus die. I found this very interesting verse and I don't think I've ever paid much attention to it at the death of Jesus. And it's in Luke 23, 47 and 8. But when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. And then it says, and all the crowds that had assembled at this spectacle when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. I've never meditated on that before. It's like he's, he's telling you that everybody saw what had happened and though they were mocking him, saying crucify him, though they were moving in with the crowd, there was some kind of change and they all went home going. This should not have happened like this. And Mary was there. Now, I don't know, but I'm thinking she was there when they took Jesus' body off the cross. Now, you've seen this dramatized, so it's easy there. It's like, boop, and they fall into his hands. How do you, how do you take the nails out of his feet and his hands? How, how do you do that? So you're looking at the, at the feet, and I don't think the hammers had claws at that point, but somehow you've got to wrench the nail out, and you don't want to break his feet. And Scripture says not one of his bones shall be broken. I don't know how they did this, but you're looking at the dead feet, and it's a mess, and this is taking effort to do this. And Mary is looking at this. Dealing with this, with her, her, her eyes, as they take this body that's all broken up, bleed, having bled, now not bleeding at all, and it's limp, and they're pulling the nails out somehow. And how do you remove the crown of thorns? Have you ever got caught in Wisconsin buckthorn, pulling it off your clothes? And so I think this is a woman's job. I think, I'm just, in my mind, I think Mary Magdalene would be the one caring for, don't make it any worse, don't make it any worse. And she, she's pulling the barbed wire off, off the skin, like, like this. And, and you're dealing with the dead facial skin of the Son of God. And you're trying not to make it worse. And you're going through all this, and you put it in the grave. And now it's, it's Friday, and you go through, it's Sabbath, you can't do anything, and you're already unclean because you touched the dead body. And so you wake up in the, what, what, what difference does it make? You wake up on Sunday, I'm going, getting up in the dark, no one can see me, I'm unclean, and I go to his grave. 
and she sees two angels and it doesn't register. And then she sees Jesus. You know the story, right? And she presumes it's the gardener. This to me speaks of a malady that happens to you and me. Sometimes we don't see Jesus because of what's going on in here in my life. And I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't get it. I'm not, I'm not seeing. I'm seeing, but I'm not seeing. You, do you know what I'm saying? It's right in the passage. He sees Jesus. She sees Jesus. She thinks it's the gardener. I don't know. That speaks of something, of something about the glorified body because on the road to Emmaus, you get two disciples that do the same thing and they, they go, were our not, hearts not burning while he was talking? But we didn't see it. They were seeing him and not seeing him. And I, I go, so, you know, she's like blind, though she can see. She's like, in a sense, blind. And I have to think about my heart. In what way do I go about my life believing in Jesus, affirming Jesus, wanting Jesus, and I'm not seeing Jesus work around me, and he's working, but I can't see it. And I, I think that is a malady that you and I have. So I'm ask, asking you rhetorically to ask this. Who, who am I this morning? Am I like Mary Magdalene? Am I blinded? I, I, you, you know that Satan blinds the minds of the unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. But I got this verse, 1 John 2.11. But the, this Apostle John, but the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his believer's eyes. That verse should hit us every instance where we have a person in our life that we don't like. Because we're too smart to say, I would hate him, I would hate her. So we don't say that. But the truth still stands. If I go around with disdain and disappointment in a way that I avoid said person, I'm walking in the darkness. And the darkness blinds my eyes. I'm asking you to put the rhetorical question. Am I a Mary Magdalene. Now that was Eve. But when then we turn to Adam, and the reason I'm making the comparison is that the scriptures are pretty clear that Eve sinned first. But the weight of responsibility and the seriousness of the sin falls on what Adam did. So the scripture describes Eve as the woman being deceived. But it doesn't talk about Adam being deceived. So here's an inference that Adam knew what he was doing and went along with the woman anyway. And so now the sin falls to the man and then outward from the man to the progeny. And so... We have a woman in John 20 who can't see. But now we have a man who will not see. So they come to Thomas and they, they say to Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And something like, you're, you're crazy. You saw a phantasm. You saw a ghost. You, you, saw, you, saw, you saw, saw your trauma. And he says, unless, unless, unless I... Put my finger in his wounds. Then I'll see. And th this, is, this, is the type of, this is the type of person that will say, I have conviction. I'm right. And I, I'm open to having a change of mind. But not really. In other words, if you can prove to me, but I know you won't. You can prove to me that my opinion ought to be otherwise, then I'll believe. And so Thomas says, I put my, if I, unless I put my finger in the wound. This is very interesting to me because Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, don't, don't touch me. 
Don't, don't cling to me. Don't touch me because they're going to send to the Father. But with, with Thomas, he says, put your hand right inside me like this. And so Jesus is actually coming to both. He, he lets Mary see. Rabboni, she says. Oh, I, I see. And J Jesus allows her to see. Or God or the Spirit allows her to see. And with Thomas, he, he's working with him to believe. But his, his unbelief is not that he can't see. His unbelief is that he won't see. That he has a, a hardened heart, though he would not say he has a hardened heart. And probably from his own perspective, he doesn't see that he has a hardened heart. He just goes, I have conviction. I'm a man of good sense. I'm a man of logical thinking. And ghosts don't happen. So if Jesus appears, i got to touch it. I'll put my finger in, into his wound, and then I'll believe, and you know that that's never going to happen. And so it's, it's, a, it's a form of saying, I'm, I'm going to stay with my opinion, even though I'm talking like I'm open. What causes a hardened heart? Well, we're now past where I should be in this sermon, so I'll just spit some out. Um, Pride caused Nebuchadnezzar to have a hardened heart. God cursed him. He was like a wolf for a while. Stubbornness. Um, I'm thinking of a prophecy in Zechariah where um, the hand appears on the... It's, it's in... I'm sorry. It's in Daniel where Belshazzar sees a hand written on the wall and, um, and there's a prophecy about stubbornness of heart will cause I don't believe I won't believe and dullness of heart will cause that phenomenon so I'm just asking the question uh, who am I today of course you're forgiven of your sins you have your son of God you have the Spirit of the Lord. If you have believed, God's provided all this totally on his own, but it's your faith in him, says the book of Romans, that reaches out and receives what he provided. So you who are sons of God, have the Spirit of God, forgiven of your sins, and have believed on Jesus. Though we fight our sins, where would you more likely be today. Are you a Mary Magdalene? I can't see. Are you a Thomas? Prove to me. I'm sticking to my guns till you can show me. And the great Savior comes to both and works with both in the unique way that we need him. I can tell you I'm a pretty stubborn person. I have great potential to be Thomas. I live in being Mary Magdalene. I need Jesus every day of my life. Lord, come to me and heal me of my leprosy and the lingering death that would fain suffocate me if it could. Bring me to heaven. Bow with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross, the tomb, the ascension into glory. We need Christ. We need the Savior. We need the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world and takes away my sin. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us. Help us to be strong in faith, to be wild in love. Help us to be patient in the face of so much resistance and antagonism. Help us to be like Jesus. Lord, I live that your glory would rest on this people, in their lives, in their family structures, in their homes, and in their progeny. Oh, Jesus, revive our hearts and make us better than we ever have been with our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.